I'm starting this project and I want to say a few words about it. You'll notice my title, and Whitney picked up on this um, almost as soon as I used it, which is, I was inspired by Facebook. So it's the Facebook relationship status that it's complicated, which very uh, well sums up the relationship between uh, Jefferson and Washington. The other image that's gone through, I've gone through a number of, as I work on this project, I've been thinking, well, what do I call it? And I think, well, Tom and George, a bromance. <laughs> George and Tom, frenemies. Um, but I've settled for it's complicated in my mind. The one way to think about this is you need to think of the American Revolution as high school. Okay, so this relationship is the relationship between the captain of the football team, who's also the homecoming king, and the class valedictorian. It is complicated. Um, that's how I've been thinking about it while I've been working on this. James Madison, chess club. <laughs> Married a cheerleader. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so this is, these are the thoughts that percolate through my mind. So the problem we have, I think, is this. Our image of Jefferson and Washington's relationship. And again, I was, as I started to think about this and work on it, I was stunned to realize there is no kind of scholarly book-length study of the topic. There's a very good chapter in one of Peter Henriquez's books on Jefferson and, and um, Washington, but really that's about it. And this is the image we have, to a certain extent. Um, fixed in stone, monumental. Marcus Cunliffe wrote a book about Washington many years ago called George Washington, Man and Monument, and to a certain extent we're stuck with the monumental Washington and looking in two different directions. They are not together. And this is the problem we have in assessing this relationship. It ends very, very badly. And this, and I'm gonna say a few words just by way of reminder about how it ended um, over the next few minutes before I kind of suggest the ways I want to approach this. And I'm very much interested in your comments because I'm just at the beginning of this project, so anything you have to say would be, would be very welcome. But I want to move beyond this, because this is the way we, were, we end up in the relationship, and I don't th it, we lose the dynamism of the relationship between these two, which was a 30-year relationship. Um, they first met in 1769, um, and Washington, of course, died in 1799. To a certain extent, Jefferson, as you will know, uh, carried on worrying about and thinking about this relationship until he died in 1826. So it's a long-standing uh, factor in each of their lives, and we've given too much attention to the very bad ending. Um, and I think that's part of the, or th that's an obstacle that I'll need to confront as I as this project goes forward. So. Bear that in mind, but we're trying to surpass that. The problem is, or a challenge we face, is we know how it ends and it doesn't end well. But Jefferson, as these two quotes suggest, and I could have picked others, was a great admirer of Washington. And I deliberately picked these because they're from the 1780s. One is his tribute to Washington from the notes on the state of Virginia, where he pays tribute to Washington's genius. In war we have produced wa a Washington whose memory will be adored while liberty shall have votaries, whose name will triumph over time and will in future ages assume its just station am amongst the most celebrated worthies in the world. And then he wrote a letter in 1789 to Francis Hopkins and basically saying, expressing similar sentiments. Jefferson's a great admirer of Washington. And as I'm going to suggest to you, Washington's a great admirer of Jefferson for a while. Um, and this is important. So Jefferson was not anti-Washington um, for his entire life. I don't even think he's anti-Washington even when he, uh, things are going to end badly um, due to, due to um, well, for reasons I'll get into in a second. But uh, Jefferson greatly admired Washington and did so throughout his entire life and in many respects was in awe of Washington. Washington in turn was a great admirer of Jefferson um, in many respects because each has different, uh, the strengths of each emphasize <laughs> what's missing in the other and they complement each other in, in many ways. If we're going with a high school analogy, this is the exchange student who comes in and causes all kinds of problems, <laughs> Felipe Mateo. Alexander Hamilton, cool kid from out of town, moves in late, really smart, 
yet hangs out at the kid, with the kids at the smoking area at the same time. He, he transcends all social groups, big problem in high school. Filippo Matze, the, the, the Jefferson-Washington relationship was quite productive uh, for most of their lives. It doesn't really go badly until each of them are in retirement to, to some extent. Jefferson writes a letter to Matze, who is all of you, many of you will know, is a, is a Italian who's a correspondent and friend of Jefferson's and he Jefferson is, writes them a, a letter which will become infamous, and Jeff will be familiar with this, in 1796. Dumas Malone said it's the writing that Jefferson most regretted throughout his entire life. In the vast corpus of Jefferson writing, this letter is a problem. And in that letter, Jefferson writes, and it's important to note, he writes it in April of 1796. Jefferson is in, his, is in retirement at that point. Uh, he's not in holding public office. But he's writing to Matze, who has returned to Italy, and he's describing the circumstances, the political circumstances, in the United States. And he says, you wouldn't believe what life is like here now. Um, the enemies and, and the boisterous sea of liberty, this is the boisterous sea of liberty letter. <laughs> he says, uh, he says you know, the, the friends of despotism have taken over the government. The friends of England have taken over the government. We've totally gone over to an English way. Tyranny is on the rise, and he said, he, the crucial uh, line in this letter is what you see quoted there, and I apologize, I should have put the quote at the top and the pictures at the bottom uh, for those in the back, but he says, it would give you a fever were I to name to you the apostates who have gone over to these heresies, men who were Samson's in the field and Solomon's in the council, but who have had their heads shorn by the harlot England. Now, somebody who lives in Scotland, we talk about the harlot England all the time. <laughs> <laughs> this is what passes for an insult in the 18th century. And it's, it's a real political insult. The Samson in the field to whom he's referring, at least everyone believes, and I think it's true, is George Washington. He's basically saying, you know, Washington is deluded too. So this is a biblically based insult of the 18th century. Today, we just, he'd just say, Washington, loser. But now, <laughs> in the context of 1796, this is a pretty damning indictment of George Washington. You have to understand Washington's place in the political firmament. He is first among equals. He is the greatest American as far as almost all Americans are concerned. And Jefferson writes this to Matt Say. It's gossipy. It's, you know, we all know if anyone who reads Jefferson's correspondence, uh, even a little bit of, you know, he's given to rhetorical flights of fancy and exaggeration sometimes. He's very good at, he's a very good writer, so he's very compelling. He's written this to Matt Say. It's critical of Washington. It's ill-judged, I think. Um, correspondence in the 18th century is a bit like email in the 21st century. You should assume anything you write is going to be read. Jefferson knows that. It's very, very common for correspondents on both sides of the Atlantic to share what they've received, especially with newspapers, and that's what Matt Say did. And he shared Jefferson's letter with a newspaper in Italy. It was reprinted, translated and reprinted. It was then translated again and reprinted in France, and it was then translated and reprinted in the United States. So it went through a series of iterations, and by the time it spread in the United States, Jefferson is vice president. So he's no longer a private citizen expressing his views about the political situation. This is very, very embarrassing to him. And it's very, very embarrassing um, and insulting as to George Washington. And George Washington interprets it as such. Jefferson writes to Washington subsequently, says, oh, you know, didn't really mean it. Let's talk about peas. And he tries, he gets, you're a farmer, you like peas. And, uh, <laughs> and Washington does not respond terribly well to this, this letter, Jefferson trying to paper things over. It is said, and Anna's here, so Anna quite, correct, quite correctly um, cautioned me about this anecdote. There's a famous anecdote that, um, is, that is retailed in the 19th century. 
that uh, Martha, the two worst days of Martha Washington's life were the time that the second worst day of Martha's life was when, Martha Washington, I should say, was when Thomas Jefferson came to Mount Vernon in January of 1801 during the electoral controversy, seeking over the election of 1800, seeking her blessing in Georgia's um, posthumous imprimatur. And she said, having Jefferson there was the second worst day of my life. The first was the day George died. So this, th there's very, very bad blood between the Jeffersons and Washingtons, or at least between Jefferson and the Washingtons as a result of this letter. Anna rightly cautioned me and said, well, that's actually a 19th century anecdote, and we're not entirely sure that it happened. The spirit of it is certainly accurate. After this letter in 1796, and after it appears in the American press, after it's translated and appears in the press, really, really sours the relationship between Jefferson and Washington. And Jefferson seeks in many respects to prove that he and Washington were actually okay with each other. Um, many people aren't buying it. I won't read you the long quote. This, of course, is John Marshall. John Marshall wrote one of the first and most important and certainly the longest biographies of George Washington uh, in the early 19th century. And in his life of Washington, um, Marshall was very, very critical of Jefferson. And again, there's a long kind of um, late 18th, early 19th century insult there, basically saying Jefferson doesn't support the Constitution. Um, and Marshall's view that Jefferson isn't really, he's basically saying he's not really a loyal American because he wasn't really on the right side of Washington and he and Washington disagreed about the Constitution. Marshall's putting out, obviously, a Federalist interpretation of these events, but he's seeking, really, to kind of fix for posterity that Jefferson wasn't really close to Washington, wasn't loyal to Washington, didn't agree with Washington, and basically was on the wrong side of Washington. If you're on the wrong side of Washington, you're on the wrong side of America. And that's very much what Marshall's seeking to prove. And this becomes a kind of commonplace among Federalists in the 1790s, in the first decade of the 19th century. And it really, really <coughs> bothers Jefferson. He spends a lot of his retirement, as many of you will know, organizing his papers uh, with an eye towards posterity. And I've written about this in another context. To a certain extent, we can view Jefferson's retirement in part as an attempt to get right with Washington, to prove that actually Washington liked him and Washington and he agreed about more than they disagreed. So he really sits down, I think, um, in, it's in response to Marshall's um, history and Marshall's biography of Washington that Jefferson compiles his anas, his papers and table talk um, from basically the primary sources, the rough material of history from his tenure as Secretary of State. He begins to compile those between 1809 and 1818, and he drafts his autobiography in 1821. And the theme of, of the Anas and the autobiography to a large extent, not exclusively, but to a large extent, is George Washington and I really agreed. <laughs> He's got a problem because they didn't. They disagreed over fundamental political principles. And the thing that really bothers Jefferson during Washington's presidency when he's Secretary of State during Washington's first administration is the fact that Washington and Hamilton tend to agree much more often than Washington and Jefferson do. This one line from the Anas more or less sums up the thesis. Washington, this is Jefferson recording comments from Washington. Uh, so in, in a, in a uh, notation that Jefferson made in October of 1792, Jefferson writes, Washington thought it important to preserve the check of my opinions in the administration in order to keep things in their proper channel and prevent them from going too far. So that's a contemporaneous note he makes. Very interesting. He's saying, look, implicit in this is an acceptance and a recognition that they didn't really agree on everything. <laughs> But, he says, Washington is so wise, and he recognizes my importance, he kept me there, more or less, as a counterbalance to Hamilton. And to some extent, that may be true. The problem we have in understanding this relationship, I think, 
And as I said, I'm just at the beginning of this, so may maybe I'll prove myself wrong, but I, uh, I'll say, I'm gonna say a few words about what I'm actually doing now, is we're stuck with this. This is the image, the image in stone of this late in life relationship that deteriorates and goes badly, and it does. Uh, and Jefferson's trying to patch this up, both first unsuccessfully with Washington, and then after Washington's death in 1799, if you will, with posterity. And he doesn't really succeed in doing so. And this, and because of the political differences they had in the 1790s, has led us, I think, astray. So what I'm doing now, and I'm, I'm looking at Jeff and his colleagues in the papers with, with gratitude, they will say, well, duh, of course you're doing this. I'm reading their entire correspondence in order, not going back with all this in mind, and actually, well, the historiography on this topic isn't terribly rich anyway, but ignoring much of the historiography at this stage and just reading their correspondence in order. Uh, it's taking a long time because it's a very lengthy correspondence. It doesn't get the attention that, say, the, obviously the correspondence with John Adams does, Jefferson and Adams' correspondence, or the correspondence between Jefferson and Madison. It's, it, it has a very, very different character but it's very, very interesting to see their relationship develop over time. In fairness, I've only got preliminary findings to share with you because I'm down to about 1792. Um, so I've still got a ways to go, including all this. But I'm, to some extent, less interested in this, because we know this, and more interested in what came before. And some very interesting things crop up. They shared a very, very close collaboration during the War of Independence, during Jefferson's governorship of Virginia, which as you know, did not go very well. Um, but they are in fairly close contact, as Washington was with political leaders across the United States because he was the commander of the Continental Army. But they're collaborating quite closely and harmoniously and talking not just about the defense of Virginia, but if you will, the uh, imperial ambitions of greater Virginia. So they spent a lot of time talking about the Northwest uh, and what to do and whether Virginia can conquer the Northwest. So uh, they're not Federalists as we'll see them later uh, at, during, during the War of Independence. And so I think that's interesting. What I've enjoyed the most though so far is the correspondence from the 1780s, particularly when Jefferson's in, in Paris um, and Washington is in nominal retirement. And they're corresponding about all manner of things. Um, they carry on a quite interesting correspondence about the Constitution. And in Jefferson's defense, and contrary to John Marshall's interpretation, they do disagree about the Constitution somewhat, but Jefferson's much more in favor of the Constitution than, his, than the caricature of him put forward by the Federalists would suggest. He's concerned about the presidency and the power of the executive. There's no doubt about that. But they agree, they have a quite interesting correspondence about the Constitution. Before Jefferson went to Paris, there's a, there's a really interesting exchange of letters where Washington writes to Jefferson, the, the Virginia House of Delegates wants to give him, that is Washington, a kind of life interest in a land company in the West as a reward for his service during the Revolution. And Washington, who's, of course, served without pay during the war, is kind of perplexed about how to handle this because he doesn't want it. And he doesn't want, but he also doesn't want to be seen, he, 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 obviously didn't use the, um, the term humble brag. He doesn't want to be seen to be elevating himself by declining it either. And he writes to Jefferson and says, look, could you help me with this? Can you actually stop this in the House of Delegates? You know, you know, I, I, I'm gratified and honored that they would like to reward me this way, but I really don't want to accept this reward. and I don't want to be rude to them by declining it, nor do I want to be seen to be kind of aggrandizing myself by declining it. So it's a fairly delicate moment. And he's entrusted this to Jefferson. And their correspondence in the 1780s is very, very cordial. It's very, very interesting. Surprisingly, the correspondence during Washington's presidency, which I thought would be richer, is fairly dull because lots of it's workaday stuff and it's them forwarding letters to each other and reports to each other because they work in an It's the kind of stuff you have in an office where you're saying, could you look at this or that or whatever. Um, so it's less, and it's less um, rich. Of course, what we're missing there is the fact that they are in proximity to each other. So they're seeing each other, they're having, co they're having conversations. That's where the Anas will be valuable. The 1780s correspondence is wonderful because Jefferson is in France. And so they are, it's their sole means of communication with each other. Whereas when Washington is president and Jefferson is secretary of state, they can directly speak to each other. So I think the, 
uh, correspondence during Was Washington's presidency is, is of more limited um, value to me. So it's going to be interesting to see how this unfolds. Um, my preliminary ideas is, as I think about them and, and begin this project, there's nothing more exciting than beginning a project because I haven't had to write anything yet and I haven't had to defend <laughs> anything I've written yet and it's just fun. Um, I think they have a lot more in common than dividing them. I think their Virginianness is really, really important. I mean, again, that seems obvious, but so much is made of their subsequent rift and that one stands for one version of the revolution and the other for a contrary version of the revolution that what they have in common has kind of been ignored and downplayed. I think there, it's a particular type of Virginianness. Of course, these are elite Virginia planters, but unsurprisingly, they share a worldview as a consequence of that. I think, and, and Krista has mentioned to me that some of the guides have been asked about this recently, I think the relationship that both men had with the institution of slavery is of course vital. They don't correspond about it, interestingly. They have very little to say about slavery, um, although both men are highly um, involved in slavery as an institution, but they don't say much to each other about it, which is interesting. A little bit about the Haitian Revolution, but that's about it uh, so far. Um, but I think that will have to figure prominently. And again, Krista and I discussed this briefly uh, yesterday. There's a tendency, I think, to say Washington's more or less a good guy. Sure, he owned slaves, but he freed them all when he, when he died. Well, of course, he didn't free them all when he died uh, because he couldn't free uh, those he inherited from Martha, and he left Martha's slaves. Um, Martha would, would still own those, those uh, enslaved people until her death. But as far as posterity is concerned, he did himself a great favor <laughs> by um, manumitting slaves in his will, um, which, of course, as you all know, um, Jefferson uh, was unwilling and unable to do uh, for most of his enslaved people, uh, most of those enslaved people that he owned. Um, and so I think there's an interesting contrast there. I, again, and Chris and I were discussing this, I suspect they have more in common than not on this question. I think circumstances were a little different for each of them. Jefferson dies much later. At the time of Jefferson's death, um, the position of slavery in Virginia is very, very different than it was in 1799. So context does matter uh, a lot in the, in, in, um, when, when considering these questions. Jefferson, of course, dies a generation later. So I think the role of slavery in their lives will be a kind of common theme, but also an area of some divergence, although I don't think it's necessarily as great a divergence as uh, many members of the public uh, would apparently believe. And I think one thing that really fascinates me about this is the nature of uh, friendship and what friendship means in the 18th century and particularly male friendship in the 18th century and again, unique to this particular class and region. Uh, and so I think that will be an interesting theme in all this. They have a wonderful correspondence, and I know Jeff likes letters about wine. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a great, I, I was reading letters yesterday, and you know, Jefferson's literally buying champagne literally by the case for Washington, and that's one of his jobs as Secretary of State. Now, there's no more perfect job for Jefferson <laughs> than buying wine by the case as a public service. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, he's really enjoying it. And you can tell he's very enthusiastic and saying, you know, don't buy the cheap stuff. You know, we need the good stuff. Um, and so I, I, think, I think it's a rich project. I think it's a fun project. I don't have much to tell you by way of um, conclusions yet because we're supposed to go where the evidence leads us. And I'm enjoying following the trail of the evidence. Thank you for your time. I'm more than happy to take questions. <laughs>